The movie opens up in space on January 12th, 2011, when three astronauts named Brian, Jocinda, and Marcus are up there to fix a satellite. As they're engrossed in work, the spaceship suddenly experiences a failure and all the electronics shut down. At the same time, Marcus notices something strange, a weird black metallic swarm coming at them really fast. Unfortunately, before Marcus and Brian can take action, the swarm crashes into their spaceship. This collision knocks out Jacinda. While Marcus is flung into space, Brian tries to grab him, but the spaceship's pull on his tether stops him, and Marcus drifts away into space. Panicked, Brian goes back into the spaceship and tries to contact Marcus, but the systems are broken. Meanwhile, the strange swarm creature drills a hole into a lunar crater and continues its descent. After that, Brian looks at Jacinda, who is unconscious, and he decides to take the spaceship back to Earth. He successfully stabilizes the shuttle, and despite having no power, manages to start a stock thruster. This creates enough energy to land the shuttle safely on Earth. Upon their arrival, Brian is labeled a hero for landing a powerless spaceship. The science doesn't really check out on that, but this is a big dumb movie about the moon falling out of the sky, so he's a hero. However, as the years pass by, officials start suspecting that he was the one responsible for the disaster. No one believes his theory about the black swarm attack either. To make matters worse, Jacinda can't back up his story because she was unconscious throughout the incident. She thinks maybe it was a solar flare or a meteor that hit their spaceship. At last, NASA concludes that it was a mistake on Brian's part. So, they fire him from his position. The story then fast forwards 10 years, and we meet Casey Hausman, a janitor at the University of California. While working, Casey often sneaks into professors' offices to use their computers. He likes to play Neopets and visit E-Bomb's world. One day, he logs into the Chile National Observatory's system and finds out that the moon is getting closer to Earth. This worries him. So, he tries to contact NASA, but no one takes him seriously. In the next scene, Jacinda is called to work early in the morning at NASA. She checks on her son, Jimmy, and gives instructions to his nanny, Michelle, before going to the space center. There, she learns that the moon's orbit has indeed changed, and their satellite has detected strange energy coming from a hole in a lunar crater. Jacinda is shocked by the revelation and decides to act quickly on the matter. Back to KC, he's frustrated with not getting through on the phone, so he heads back to the professor's office to conduct more research. While he's going through a newspaper, he learns about an event called Astronaut Day happening at the local museum. Boy, that's lazy writing. Realizing that this may be his only chance to find someone useful, KC prints out his research and drives to the museum. Coincidentally, the main speaker at the event is none other than Brian. When the two meet, KC wastes no time and explains about the moon's changing orbit. However, Brian doesn't believe him. <laughs> Where'd you hear that? One of your professor's computers? And instead calls security to remove him from the museum. As he's being taken away, Casey scatters his papers, hoping that Brian will read them later. Later in the evening, Brian learns that his son, Sonny, this writing has been arrested by the police. Here, it is revealed that after he got fired from NASA, he spiraled into depression and lost his home. His wife also divorced him and took custody of their only son. The next day, he goes to Sonny's trial, determined to make things right. However, Brian only ends up causing a commotion by interrupting the judge and making up stories to defend his son. This leads to the trial being postponed, and Sonny is kept in jail until the next hearing. Meanwhile, Jacinda and her team discover that the moon is getting closer to Earth and will break break apart soon, with city-sized pieces crashing into our planet. They also see a hole in the moon, which is a sign that time is running out. Not long after, news of the moon's collision threats spreads on social media. The person who leaked this confidential info is none other than KC, as he got tired of waiting for NASA to act. In the next scene, Jocinda and her senior, Albert, hold a press conference to explain the situation. They assure the public that everything is under control. However, this announcement isn't enough to stop the chaos, as people begin and overcrowding the stores to stock up on supplies. Toilet paper and eggs, everybody. You know the drill. At the same time, NASA holds a meeting and decides to observe the moon by sending astronauts to space. After a day of preparation, they manage to assemble three experienced astronauts. Later, the shuttle arrives at the moon's atmosphere and hovers itself above the crater. But as soon as the astronauts send a probe into the moon's hole, the same strange black swarm from earlier shows up. It attacks the shuttle and kills all the astronauts. Jacinda and her colleagues witness everything on their screen and are 
taken aback. Meanwhile, the situation in big cities is deteriorating. Millions of people are leaving their homes in hopes of finding safer locations. Brian also finally gets to know about the danger. He then remembers KC trying to convey the same thing long before anyone else knew about it. Hence, he starts looking for information about the man. Soon, Brian tracks down KC at a restaurant and asks him how he knows so much about the moon. I was just playing Roblox on my prof's PC and it popped up. The latter shares that he has spent years studying distant planets and looking for huge structures in our solar system. As the two are engaged in conversation, suddenly there's a change in the moon's gravity. This causes violent tsunamis and earthquakes on Earth. The restaurant also gets engulfed by a tsunami, but our heroes somehow manage to survive. Back at NASA, Jacinda's boss Albert realizes that they can do nothing about the situation, so he quits his position and rushes off to a safe location. This leaves Jocinda in charge of the entire organization. To find more about the Black Swarm, she checks video archives from Brian's suit during their mission in 2011. Why did no one do that before? Shockingly, she discovers that Brian was indeed telling the truth. The video clearly shows the Black Swarm attacking the spaceship, but for some reason, NASA decided to keep this information hidden from the public. After this, Jocinda immediately conducts a meeting with the military, and they consider using nuclear weapons on the moon. However, she believes that there's no way to fix the moon's orbit without destroying it. She then contacts her ex-husband, Major Doug, to talk about an electromagnetic pulse, or EMP, called Zulu X-Ray 7, which might help them destroy the mysterious black entities and bring the moon back to its orbit. Doug, who is working in the military, agrees to help, but only if she and her son Jimmy join him after the mission. Yeah, fine, I'll help you save the world, but, but only if I get to see those sweet legs again. Next, Jacinda figures out that she needs to go to the moon to find out what's really going on, and she wants Brian to go with her. He is the right person, because he's the only one who has seen the Black Swarm and has the ability to operate the shuttle even in a worn-out condition. That night, a military helicopter comes to take Brian, but he agrees to go only if KC can come with him. This movie has a logic score of negative five. Next, they meet Jacinda, who tries to explain things that they already know. She shows them a video of the swarm attacking the astronauts and says it's made up of different AI-powered nanotechnology. Brian agrees to help on one condition. His son, Sonny, must be released from jail and brought to the evacuation spot for safety. Once they agree, they get an old shuttle from a museum to carry the EMP. Right then, Earth starts experiencing violent earthquakes and volcanic eruptions. This is strange because the moon's gravity isn't strong enough to cause these things. It supports KC's idea that the moon is a hollow megastructure. Sadly, an earthquake damages the shuttle at their base, and with a missing engine, they can't launch. But while everyone else gives up, KC keeps working on calculations for the launch. They eventually realize that when the moon is right over Earth, its gravity is almost as strong as Earth's is. And if they launch at that exact time, they can use the moon's gravity to compensate for the damaged engine. <laughs> yeah. Following this, the trio groups up and quickly formulates a plan. Brian will fly the shuttle, Jocinda will be the guide, and KC will use his calculator for shit. Before they take off, KC calls his mother, while Jacinda and Brian say goodbye to their respective sons, who will be meeting Doug. Brian even gives Sonny a gun for protection. Brian is unhinged. As they get ready to launch, a big gravity wave hits the base, causing widespread destruction. The sea waves come close to the shuttle, but Brian manages to use the moon's gravity to make a narrow escape. After a few minutes, as the shuttle approaches the moon, they turn off all their electronic devices. Brian then uses the thrusters manually even though they encounter debris along the way. Back on Earth, the weather is going haywire because the moon is very near. It's also raining debris, and some of them are the size of a building. To avoid all this, Michelle and the boys have to take shelter in a flimsy shack until it's safe. Who needs a flimsy shack when you've got plot armor? On the other hand, when the shuttle nears the moon, Brian takes a rover with the EMP and sets it up as bait for the black swarm. Unfortunately, the swarm completely ignores the rover and instead goes after the shuttle. Brian assumes the rover's remote control might be what's attracting them, so he destroys it. But the swarm keeps approaching at a rapid pace. Just when it seems like the shuttle is about to be engulfed, Brian figures out that Casey's phone is the source, so he gets rid of it. Even though KC is a millennial nerd, he somehow doesn't freak out about this. This finally dissuades the swarm, and they go away. Now, the group will have to guide the shuttle into the moon, and they only have two hours to do it before the military launches their nukes. Elsewhere, after all the crazy weather settles down, Michelle and the boys continue their journey, but they soon reach a dead end, with angry residents pointing their guns at them. Fortunately, Sonny's stepdad, Tom, spots them and takes them away. Back at the moon, the shuttle carefully enters the mysterious hole, now entering 
morning, the moon's anus. When they reach a certain point, they discover that Casey's idea was right. The moon is a megastructure around a power core. The AI-powered nanotechnology swarm is the one absorbing the power and trying to break down the moon. At this moment, the trio gets ready to use the EMP against the swarm, but something unexpected happens. The shuttle starts moving by itself. The swarm almost gets them, but a door opens and the light guides the shuttle inside. Unfortunately, the landing is a bumpy one and the shuttle ends up getting wrecked. As the group lies there unconscious, a mysterious light scans them. Back on Earth, the military loses patience and decides to launch the nuclear missiles. Because of this, Doug calls his son and gives him the bad news that they can't go to the bunker anymore. At this point, oxygen is quickly depleting from the air, so Sonny and the others are forced to wear oxygen masks. They then continue their journey to find a safe place, if there is one. On the moon, Jacinda and KC wake up and are surprised to find that they can breathe and there's gravity. But Brian appears to be missing. Suddenly, a door at the end of the room opens. Casey is skeptical about entering, but Jacinda thinks that someone is trying to help them. Brian, on the other hand, is talking to a friendly being. He wakes up in a strange room with white light, and it shows him information through images. Taking the form of Sunny, this being reveals that it's an operating system, OS, created by ancient humans a long time ago, when they had advanced technology and peace. It further discloses that the swarm is an AI that was supposed to help humans, but it became so intelligent that it developed its own thinking and killed its creators. Ultron and the Terminator have nothing on the moon's butthole bugs. The OS then tells Brian that to beat the swarm, they need to lead it away from the moon's core and destroy it. This way, the moon can finally go back to its orbit. After a while, Jacinda and Casey locate Brian inside the room and help him get up. The team then regroups and finds their damaged shuttle fixed and ready to go. They decide to try one last time to deal with the swarm. Brian is even willing to sacrifice himself for the sake of mankind. In the next scene, the group powers up their shuttle and flies away from the moon with the AI swarm following them relentlessly. Though Brian made it clear that he would be the one to make the sacrifice, KC secretly grabs EMP and releases himself from the shuttle. He then leads the swarm to a safe location and detonates the EMP, killing them all. That's it. Good job, Sam. With this sacrifice, the moon finally begins moving to its original spot. Science, bitch. Brian and Jacinda also manage to use a pod to get back to Earth safely. In the final scene, Casey's consciousness is put into the moon's base, and the OS talks to him. It takes the form of his mother and says that they have an important mission to begin. The hell was what? Why did NASA hide the videos of the AI? <laughs> Subscribe for more videos like this, turn on notifications, and leave a like to help the channel out. Thank you for watching.